Okay, hello everybody and welcome, welcome to our latest fireside chat. So, um, uh, we've got to say thank yous to all of our lovely sponsors, one of whom is here with us today, mm. Software Sold. It's got uh, Landmark Information, Set Squared Exeter, Grey Matter and Stephen Scone, who uh, very generously keep a, a community interest company like ours going. So, um Welcome everyone here, my name's Catherine and I'm here with my co-host Sarah for our second fireside chat session. Um, so we'll introduce our guests very shortly, but just first to uh, tee up what our Tech Exeter and Digital Exeter who are hosting today. So Tech Exeter is a community that exists to champion the best in tech and digital across the greater Exeter area. We do this by running free meetups and events like the one we're doing tonight. We do loads of different outreach activities where we can, like with schools and with the annual Pride festivals. Uh, we work with Exeter Council, Exeter College and University of Exeter, as well as many other groups in the region. And we run an annual tech conference, which we will talk a bit more about today, uh, with amazing local and international speakers. And I should point out it's not just me who's looking after Tech Exeter. Uh, there are other two leaders. Chris is over behind the screens oh. in the background, <laughs> as he often is, being the hardcore techie that he is. And Jacob, who's probably looking after his, uh, his babies at home. Um, and we, Hi, Jacob. <laughs> we miss you. Um, and we've got our wonderful sister community, Digital Exeter, that is run by Philippa, who's not with us tonight, and Sarah, who is right next to me. So we've got a big leadership team and lots of other community helpers that assist us, even people like Shane from Somerset coming down to help us out every now and again. <laughs> uh, and uh, behind the scenes as well as Tech Exeter Chris, we've got our other Chris for Digital Hi. Exeter. So. Which Digital Exeter just call Chris because, you know, we don't need to other him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I head up uh, Digital Exeter together with Philippa. Um, and Chris and uh, before um, it's in 2019 we were still running in-person events and they would run alongside Tech Exeter specific events but we would cater more for the digital community so I'm really glad that Shane is here today to sort of fly the flag for the digital people in the southwest. Great so uh, we said we'd introduce our wonderful guests and tonight we're joined by James Chammings from Software Soul. Hello. Hello. And Shane Griffiths from Digital Somerset. Hello. So why don't you kick off by you guys telling yourselves a bit about yourselves. I'll, I'll start with James as you were first on the billing on my yeah. sheet. <laughs> okay. Hi. So, um, yeah, so I'm from Software Solved. We're a, a company that make a bespoke software and we specialise in the insurance um, sector and risk and things like that. And um, my role is um, automation tester, software tester. So once the developers make their code, then I make sure it works properly. Is that crucial? Yeah. And Shane, who are you? What do you do? I'm Shane. Um, hi. I'll just start off by saying that I'm a bit excited. This is the first time I've been around humans in a while. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be on my best behaviour as much as I can. Uh, but I guess I wear uh, a few hats. But tonight I'm, talk I'm, I'm here as, uh, uh, I guess, a co-founder of Digital Somerset. Uh, previously Digital Taunton. But we were greedy and we wanted to sort of monopolise the entire area. Uh, and essentially, um, a bit like Digital Exeter, you know, Digital Somerset was created for kind of two main purposes, really. Uh, it was to, uh, to curate a community of people 
and to uh, and to build an identity um, for for Somerset, which maybe we'll talk about a bit more later. Brilliant, fantastic! Thank you. Welcome. Hey. Welcome, yeah, it's guys. Good to be here. I love it. I love the space. I love I love all the lights and the jazz mm -hmm. and yeah, um, it's great. And uh, just just like Top Gear, we've already put your driving oh, skills to the test, so we'll no. see a bit of that later I with was our... so bad. <laughs> with our... way better than me. Oh, I, I was terrible. <laughs> with our, our Mario Kart uh, track that was set up in the other room. So, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty fun. Uh, I tell you, everyone, that uh, you can hear Shane from a long way away. <laughs> I got a bit carried away. You, you, could, you could be heard in Taunton. Yeah. You could be heard over the football. Over the football <laughs> hooligans, yeah, I know. Brilliant. And then just to let you guys know who are watching on YouTube, first of all, hi, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here with us. You can ask live questions, so please just pop them in the chat. The team will pick them up, and at the end, we'll uh, pick uh, the sort of whatever's been asked and ask those questions to our two very esteemed guests. And well, one hypo and one esteemed <laughs> guest. So there you go. <laughs> okay, so we've got a few questions for in the room first before we, uh, while well, the audience ponder what they're going to ask you. Um, so uh, we'll start with a, as a question that's directed at each of you, but you're free to jump in to it as well. Um, so James, I... You know, looking at your LinkedIn beforehand and looking mm -hmm. at the details, job title there is Automation Test Analyst, mm -hmm. which sort of got me thinking, well, what is that? So, um, and, and one of the things we found, we do a lot of work supporting schools and trying mm -hmm. to get more interest in STEM and technology at the younger age groups. And one of the things schools are telling us at the moment is that young people just don't really know what is out there in mm -hmm. terms of tech careers. And there's this huge diversity of different things, and, and what does it mean if they were to start down a track to a technology career? So I was hoping you could maybe tell us a bit about what is an automation test analyst, what, what mm -hmm. do you enjoy about it, yeah. and how did you get into that role? Okay, so yeah, as an automation test analyst, um, as I said a little earlier, um, I test software to make sure it works properly, and so it um, is exactly what the client wants. So. Um, the automation side of it comes into the fact that I actually write code to make it test itself overnight. And so we can test it overnight, every night, again and again. So that whenever the developers are making small tweaks, we can keep checking it um, and flagging up any small differences um, that are in the code, find any bugs really quickly, um, and to make sure that the quality of the code and the product that we are producing for our clients are as high as possible. Um, so I'm... A geek, I'm a nerd. I've got a lot of certificates to say I'm a geek. Um, so when I went to school, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, so I did A levels, uh, GCSEs, and A levels. And I, I don't. Well, I said I don't really know what I want to do. What's the best thing, or what can I do? And I decided to go for physics. So I did a degree in physics at the University of Surrey. And um, while I was there, I managed to do a sandwich year in um, Geneva. Wow. at the Particle Physics Accelerator Centre. Oh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, it was yeah. really cool. So, so, for example, I was there having coffee with my um, my supervisor and he would, like, point over and go, oh, you see those three guys over there? They're Nobel Prize winners. And I was like, wow, crazy. So, but, um, yeah, it was, it was an amazing experience and um, that's where I first discovered my love of lasers. And um, so my job there was to measure the beam profile coming out of this lead iron source where they had a piece of lead and they would take this massive laser that was the size of a building and shine it on this piece of lead and it would evaporate the lead and so the, all the irons would come off and then they'd send it down the tube and that's how they could get all these irons around the big accelerator. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so when the laser hit it, it all the, everything just went <clears throat> and my job was to measure the spread coming out. So that was really fascinating. Um, and so you go from lasers to automating uh, Tesco. <laughs> well, I shall, I shall get there. <laughs> Don't worry. Be patient. <laughs> I'm on tenterhooks. So, yeah. um, so, so, so I love lasers so much that I did a PhD in semiconductor laser physics. Um, and if you want to know what that is, that's basically Leonard from the Big Bang Theory. I was just about to mm. say that. I remember him in He's... the lab with all his yes. like, optics things, things, these lasers flying around. That was me for four years at the wow. University of Surrey again. Um, 
Okay, China. so, you know, because this is not being broadcast or anything, <laughs> did you ever point a laser at something that wasn't really supposed to catch fire or, like, <laughs> do any, like, naughty things? You don't have to go into details. No, Just... but we, we had some fun with some liquid nitrogen. That was okay. quite good. Oh, that is always fun. Did you do the banana? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the banana. yeah absolutely, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, so, so um, my role was to see these lasers. They were s supposed to be able to be grown on silicon. So that enabled um, digital communicate optical communication straight to a computer chip, and this was going to revolutionise um, on and off chip data transfer in computer systems. But they were rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what my PhD discovered: that these lasers needed so much current and at like liquid nitrogen temperatures that it just wasn't worth bothering with, to be honest. Um, yeah. So that was that was that. Um, and unfortunately, I finished my PhD right at the financial crisis. Um, so there wasn't much of a job opportunities around. And the other thing, I wanted to come back to the southwest because this is a beautiful part of the world and why would yeah, anyone yeah. not want to live here? <laughs> so, I was, so there's not much um, job opportunities for semiconductor laser physicists in the southwest. Is there not? <laughs> really so to be are. fair, I'm, I'm shocked now, now, no, Epic now is shocked, open. Is, they, um, is that? Isn't that in... Is that not in Taunton? Maybe, uh, maybe one of the Chris's yeah. can fact check where Epic is and what, yeah, what that would be a good chance for. Yeah, but, but back in 2009 when it was, I couldn't, yeah. well, I couldn't find anywhere. So I, so I went into software testing and found a, a company in um, Bristol that tested televisions, and they took televisions all around Europe. And that was quite fascinating, and that got me into the testing um, kind of industry. And um, being a physicist, I wanted to go down the technical route so in, in software development, you have uh, manual testers that check that everything works properly by hand, and then you have the automated testers, which I am, which actually write them program code to do it. So that's why I'm, I've kind of focused my efforts into the, the test. It's quite interesting, though. I wonder if, you know, the idea that an automation tester, hmm. that, that maybe the goal is to actually make yourself redundant and actually do yourself out of a job because you could write automation tests that could replace you. That would yeah. be quite cool, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a big debate about whether you still need manual testers when you have the automation testers there. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, automation testing is um, machine only needs, can be machine readable. You can't beat a set of eyes on, on an application. Mm. And, for example, for access, um, making it just look nice and presentable for, for, for all people then that's a really big thing and it's something like a machine can't really do so well. Mm. But, be, be, but, but 10 years' time, 20 years' time? Mm. Then well, maybe might... with all this um, um, image recognition things mm. coming along, then it's, uh, yeah, it's getting... So what do you enjoy most about, about your automation testing, automated testing? Um, it, there's a little bit of, well, finding other people's mistakes is quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, the, it's actually, I'm, I'm not... A, coder but I really enjoy writing the code and um, making making it you know it's like any developer you can see the progress and see what you've made and, mm. and you can see your tests running really fast in front of you and it's just brilliant to see it going pressing all the buttons and entering all the fields and blah blah blah, blah. So, great yeah. well that I was not expecting such no. a fascinating answer. That's I feel really like I've been on a, yeah, yeah. a journey. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were in Geneva just now, mm -hmm. and now we're back here. So um, I think you've enriched our evenings mm. by that sort of... If I was at college now, I'd want to go out, buy a couple of lasers, mm. just sort of yeah. strap them together. And, mm. It is it's it's possible you've encouraged more people into laser yeah. tech <laughs> than into <laughs> automation <laughs> testing, but I guess anyone who's watching, I want to be sure this is some young people who who likes picking holes in other people's mm. work mm. <laughs> and seeing things appear in front of them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, and no that brings us over to our other guest, um, Shane from <laughs> Digital <laughs> Somerset. And we're saying it in a funny way. And I'm just going to let everybody into the joke. because Full transparency. Because <laughs> Shane, who I called Sean, which is not the worst <laughs> in the story, forgot Catherine's and my name. Yeah. As in, like... Blank forgot, like had no clue. He's met us several times before. Yeah, I've met you guys loads of times. We've worked together at, at the uh, um, tech conference last year. We like basically worked together for two whole days. <laughs> Could not remember, had no oh, clue. Yeah. It was brilliant. So now I'm tempted to call him Sean for Yeah, forever. well, I, I deserve it, <laughs> honestly. They're, like, you know, I've been at home so much that there's just parts of my brain that I just don't need to use at the moment. Absolutely. As long as I can remember my wife's name and my Great. dogs. I think you 
you're doing well. I'm, I think, I think you're I'm doing right. really well. Uh, if Philip is watching, then he oh, remembered yeah. your name. Yeah. So <laughs> you are the most memorable of, of, all, of all of us. Yeah, you can't, Which, you can't forget Philippa. You can't, no. No, no we all miss her. Hi, Philippa. <laughs> um, anyway, now that everybody is filled into our little yes. hilarity, and maybe you had to be there, so really sorry. Yeah, yeah. But also not sorry. Mm. Um, you were already telling us earlier that you are the co-founder of Digital Taunton, now Digital Somerset. Yeah. Um, and you're sort of a sister com like community to Digital Exeter and Tech Exeter. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how your community came to be and also maybe your strengths that you've shown in um, in the change we've all had to make regarding our community? <clears throat> yeah, no, it's it's been a really interesting journey. I think for us, um, you know, Taunton is not typically the, you know, isn't usually associated with tech or innovation or creativity. There's, you know, and, and, and basically it was a few years ago now there was a conference and, uh, and, and Jeremy, who I run Digital Somerset with, we were both there. We didn't really know each other. And this, the council were putting on this conference and all these local businesses were asked to attend. And the idea is it, it was a way of the council kind of informing Uh, local businesses about what was going on in the area, all the exciting things that are happening. And there were lots of slides about infrastructure and roads and trains and, um, and, and various bridges that were being built. And, and no one, and, and, and I was, and throughout the, the presentation, I was getting more and more kind of, at first excited about kind of what, what I was going to learn, what the council were doing. And then it got to the end of the presentation, I realized that no one was talking about any kind of digital agenda, any kind of, you know, the digital economy or the creative or tech sector, you know, the pretty much the biggest sector, right, in the UK. And, uh, and no one was talking about it. No, it wasn't on anyone's agenda. It wasn't on anyone's radar. So when they said any questions, I sort of stood up and said, I love it. I love the fact that the trains are going to be awesome. <laughs> and I, I know it's going to be great that we're going to go to London really, really quick. And I'm really excited about that. However, anyone got any thoughts about tech or you know, this, this booming sector that everyone's kind of, you know, clawing to get a piece of, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, and they didn't really have much of an answer. So, um, so everyone was like clapping and high-fiving me and like hugging me and like thought it was like the best question ever. That, that didn't happen. <laughs> a couple of people, about to say. a couple of people kind of went, hey, hey. <laughs> and, um, and, and then after that, uh, Jeremy came up to me and said, um, hello, and, uh, and, and agreed with me that, that something needed to be done, that there needed to be some kind of glue that brought people together. Because, you know, lots of people work in tech in the creative sector uh, in Somerset, and it just needed a way to bring it together. So we created Digital Taunton, and essentially it was just a way of putting Taunton on the map, a way of bringing people together, collaborate, sharing ideas, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and, it, and it was really popular. And we did a load of evening events and we got someone to pay for the pizza every month. Yes. And, um, and it just kind of grew from there, really. And, I, and you know, to answer to your, your second part of the question, I think where I think our strengths lie is the fact that um, we kind of take identity quite seriously. You know, the idea that our kind of understanding of what a tech cluster is. Mm. I think there's a big part of that that's marketing and identity and communication and, um, and not just about putting on events and, and talks and presentations and stuff. It's about having something for people to get buzzed about, you know, and, and excited about. And I think that's what we're trying to do and try and put as much energy into it as possible. Amazing. Yeah. So as we are obviously all working together, we're not in competition with each other. In no. fact, we collaborate on a lot of things. Um, What do you? What is sort of your wish for the southwest in terms of digital and tech, as we look at communities and sort of the growth over the next few years? I, I mean, one thing I've learned from doing this already, uh, you know, for, for a couple of years now, is that there are so many passionate people in the southwest. You know, you guys and what's going on in Plymouth, all the way down to Cornwall, there are these kind of key individuals or groups of individuals that are just incredibly passionate about wanting to create something or curate something for their town or city and and I'm excited about the how those people can come together and uh, and Tech Southwest is a good example of this kind of overarching initiative that attempts to bring all the clusters together and uh, over the next few years I'd like to see 
that kind of built upon and maybe um, you know much more transparency and and sort of unifying the clusters in a way where um, you know the more people you band together the more powerful it can be right and uh, and I think the southwest has got an awful lot going for it um, you know and Exeter obviously Exeter's Exeter right you know and but but Taunton mm-hmm. is an example of they, I just see so much potential and uh, and so many people write it off as a place where it's like it's not exactly a destination for anything hugely exciting but but what we're noticing now is that just by doing this it's just a small step forward and uh, and education, I think someone talked about education earlier, you know, that plays a big part in this. You know, the idea that so many people are leaving Taunton. They're getting educated at a college level. There's no university yet, but there is a college. And they're going to college and they're assuming that they have to leave Taunton or Somerset yeah. to get a good job. Now, sectors vary and stuff, but I think the general consensus is that there are good jobs in Somerset mm-hmm. and Taunton. It's just that there is this kind of... There isn't that energy around it. Yeah. And people just assume that they have to go to Bristol, they have to go yeah. to Exeter, mm. or they have to go to London. Uh, I, and I, I had a good job in Taunton. Yeah? Mm. Whereabouts was that? Um, Where on your journey from <laughs> Geneva? Yeah, yeah. From lasers to... Uh... <laughs> no, um, it was another um, automation software um, job that I did. Um, a company called Metron, which is now SyncSort. Uh, I've not heard of those, no. No, so it's um, in capacity management. So they... Um, um, like a large supermarket needs to know that their computer systems are going to run. Yeah. Right, nice. cool. And um, so this company did that. There, there's a lot going on. Yeah, yeah, it's, there is, it's, honestly. It's, it's under the radar. A little it's bit. just yeah. not as... It's just not it's as bubbled just, up as, yeah. as some other the other you know, th- towns and cities. I think also the other thing is that the like tech and digital industry within the southwest. Um, a the southwest is maybe not even no, really known for it and that's because mm. it's not one of the traditional sectors right yeah. like tourism and hospitality which are really strong here and we love mm. those yeah, yeah. we really do but i think the future is in digital and in tech and actually giving our young people the education they need mm-hmm. the awareness of where they can go and what they mm. can do and finding the niche where they go get into a room with people like themselves and they go like mm. i found my tribe thank you very much yeah, and then yeah, it's yeah. about the the employers in the region also becoming known working with communities like ours to then foster that sort of community that draws people in mm. and gets them to stay because you returned to mm. the southwest mm. from mm. living away i don't know i did the same thing i went to go. berkshire and windsor and came back mm. uh, exactly i moved here from from london mm. i came from germany mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a very long way away but in 12 years i have not moved away and i have no plans mm. to do so mm. no, it is I. it is a lovely part of the world and i think I think lockdowns and everything have shown people that yeah. you can work yeah. anywhere. So why would you yeah. not choose to work in, a, in you know, one of the most beautiful yeah, parts no, of the I country? Yeah, I totally agree. So I, I feel like, given that you mentioned Tech Southwest, and we're talking about Unifying, we should maybe give a plug that, that uh, the Tech Southwest Awards are open for yes. submissions yeah. at the moment. Yeah. And so that's one of the many initiatives for trying to raise the profile yeah. of businesses in a region. And it's, it's free to put in a, a submission. And so... They've got quite a lot of different categories, so if anyone's interested, <laughs> I don't know if Software Solves putting in for a, an award this <laughs> year, so. or you're probably sponsoring <laughs> one, I would imagine. Do you have questions from the audience? Oh, questions. questions. This is what I was trying to do. Where, where do they... To the oh, top. at the top, not at the bottom. We, okay, is it? Oh, yeah, no, there is nothing. Nothing? No. Nothing is coming up. Technical oh. difficulties. <laughs> Bear with sing please. the technical difficulties song. How about you? <laughs> how about you go into um, our sort of conference theme and I check it on my phone. We'll go into to get our the question. Yeah, we've got We've with. got one more so uh, one more question from from us from the room, um, and also another plug because we like a shameless plug. So I mentioned earlier the Tech Exeter conference is coming round again for uh, how many years are we up to now, Chris? Uh. Seven or eight years. So many. So many. We've forgotten how many we've done. Um, And one of the biggest sort of tech conferences we've got going on in the region, certainly for Exeter. Uh, And last year we did our first fully digital event, and we're going to be doing that again this year, September 8th. Um, We've just selected our speakers, so we will be announcing those soon. So that's very exciting. Um, and tickets will go on sale around the same same time, so keep your eyes peeled for that. 
Now, we like to pick a theme each year and we like to pick something that can be interpreted in lots of different ways so that we get a big variety of speakers. And this year's theme, which Sarah came up with this year, is... Access. Access. So last, last Fireside Chat, last month, um, there was a conversation about access in terms of physical accessibility. So I wanted to do, you know, we're looking at all kinds of things. It could be... It could be access via education, which we've talked about. It could just be technically like, what, how do you build a good login page? Mm. Anything along the theme of access. So I wanted to ask both James and Shane, what, uh, what, what does access make you think of? What does access mean to you? And, and what thoughts do you have about improving access in whichever area? So I'll, I'll start with Shane this time. Ooh, tough one. Um, I think for me, what comes to mind, and I think it's, it's on the general theme of... of, um, of of education for me, and it's something that I'm definitely passionate about, is, is the idea of how, within the context of technology, um, the way in which technology can um, potentially completely change the education system, and um, it can, it can um, provide access, if you like, um, to resources for those from sort of diverse or um, you know, backgrounds where, where they couldn't usually have access, you know. So technology is, is a massive enabler to all these things. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, what your background was, what your parents did. You can actually have, you know, a level of education that, you know, is, is parallel to any of the top universities, you know, if you wish, if you wanted to apply yourself in that way. And I think technology can just completely change the game. And, um, and I think the way in which we look at edu the education system now, I don't think it's going to look the same in 10, 20 years' time. I think it's going to be completely different. The way, the way universities charge what they charge, you know, for an education that you could probably get on lynda.com uh, for 30 quid a month, you know, in the basic fundamentals of software development or, you know, design or whatever, especially in the tech space, there's definitely... Because, um, you know, my, my degree was in computer science and, and I learned some amazing sort of fundamentals. But, you know, and, and I definitely, you know, wouldn't ever take that away. But I don't think it should, you know, the thing's going to change in future. And I think that... The pandemic's kick-started it as well. I think it's brought it forward yeah. like five years, mm -hmm. maybe definitely. more. And, you know, within the context of, of businesses, mm. they, um, they're implementing their kind of... Um, IT strategies like five years sooner than mm. what they, like mm. they were, and um, and I think it's really really exciting, mm. you know. Uh, and it and you know and and it's quite interesting. I think we're going off topic a little bit from access, but the way in which tech companies are actually during the pandemic, tech companies are actually making more money mm. um, than what they were before the pandemic, and I think mm. that's sort of a good indication of where the strengths are mm. within our economy. It does kind of tie in, doesn't it? Because um, with the pandemic. Um, everything is now remote with Zoom and Teams and things, and that means. It Are you is... Teams or Zoom? We're Teams. Oh, I'm Zoom. Other video conferencing uh, software platforms <laughs> are available. Are there though? <laughs> I yeah. think there's also access, you know, access to markets. There's yeah. a yeah. bit of that yeah. in there, yeah. which is why we like these nice, nice broad, broad topics yeah, that you can no, interpret how you want. So, James, how do you interpret access? So, as a software tester, it's all about how well does the software work and how accessible is it for all the population. Um, so, as a tester, you want to pick out all the small little bits. So, it's about um, is the UI nice for people with, with um, vision impairment or is it, you know, can it be really useful for people with hearing impairment and things like this? So, are there all these ni really nice usability and UX functions? Um, that can go on it, so it's something. That... I thought we agreed that you were going to talk about Microsoft Access. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really disappointed you didn't play that. No, yeah. nobody agreed with you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I thought that was a cracker. I'm just going to leave it on the table for the next month and someone pick it up. I think um, that's really key. When I was mm. studying web tech for, um, back when I was, was learning to code, oh, the head of the course was very, very big on mm. accessibility and websites, so it's always something... I watch out for like making sure things can be screen reader accessible, Absolutely. making sure you've got 
alt text and images. Mm. And it is tricky now because so many people are building websites from WordPress, etc., mm -hmm. where they don't know these things. Yes. They don't mm. don't know how to build them in. So any tips and advice on uh, improving that sort of access, Will? Mm, that's a good question. I, <laughs> I can help with that question because yeah. that's what I do for a living. Yeah. Uh, when I'm not doing Digital Somerset, I design and build websites. Um, and uh, so accessibility is a big part to what, what we do as, a, as an agency. May I just say that I'm very surprised that you haven't mentioned the Core Web Vitals update by Google, which I would be thinking that you'd be really hot on this year, but no. Well, yeah, I mean, I haven't had a chance to, to look at it. <laughs> okay. But cool, what what are the core web vitals? They're changing. To what? To as in UX actually becomes part of ranking. So any digital mm. marketer and SEO person out oh, there yeah, yeah, is yeah. quaking in their boots right now as they're being rolled out. Well, yeah, but the algorithms change all the time. Yeah, but it's really... Uh, core indicators that are shifting, which is great for the user. That is why access was actually, that is why I was inspired by it, because for the first time in a long time, the usability of a website is a ranking factor. Mm. It wasn't before. So finally now, mm. the best, the most Well, it depends what you define as usability. Right? Of course, Because yeah. performance has been a ranking factor for ages. Performance mm. itself, yes, you but know, the actual... And, and hierarchy of content, which is an accessibility you yeah. know, consideration, that's been ranked for quite a long but time. But the actual so. user experience wasn't. Well, it's how do you define user experience? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so anyway, that's something for another time. Okay. <laughs> but coming back, uh, you were going to give us some tips on, well, on no, putting accessibility it's, it's, in your website. Uh, more so um, as a point, because it's, um, you know, in all honesty, when, when, you're, when you're doing, when you're working for clients, we're doing client work. So if you're in a product organisation, then accessibility is, is just something that, you, you know, you're going to take... Uh, hopefully quite seriously and you have the time and the resources and probably even the teams um, to, to really think about it. Where it gets quite interesting from my perspective and being completely honest, it, it, sometimes it is hard to put accessibility considerations in place because it's actually quite hard. Mm -hmm. like, it is difficult, it's not easy, uh, it's, a, it's a massive world to navigate and quite often, you know, there are situations where budgets mm. are stretched so thin when you're working on a, you know, for a commercial website, for an SME, you know, that only want to spend X amount yeah. and they want all these features and you're wanting to accommodate those features and deliver a good product. But the client doesn't really care about accessibility. Mm. They all say they do, but most of them really, you know, if you said... Um, I could spend three days on accessibility or I can spend three days building you that location lookup system so people can find your offices. What would you, you know, mm. budgets are budgets. And nine times out of ten, they will say that they will have that cool feature that their competitors have. So I think a big part of it is kind of how people can educate people outside of our mm. community on the importance of accessibility. Because if they take it more seriously and if they know what to look for, then they yeah. can put more pressure on the people that build the products and don't allow it just to be kind of swept under the rug, right? That they will be able to hold the people they employ mm -hmm. to account. And I think there could be a lot of work done in that sort of space. I actually agree with you. So actually creating advocates of access mm. within mm. our community that then influence the business side of our companies and further beyond. Maybe those should be t-shirts we sell for the mm. conference. Advocates of access. Mm. <laughs> hey, yeah. you know, put a digital strategist in there. Hashtag. They will just bring it up. <laughs> Shane is going to um, draw us up the website. Mm. You're going to test it's, it. Um, You're going to project manage it. We've got it. I mean, we've I, got the tagline. You know, I, honestly, though, it's... It, it's um, for so many companies, and not everyone, but it's just like, it's so easy to say the words, yeah. that, you know, to talk the talk and not walk the walk, you know, but to actually be uh, an organisation that really cares uh, when it comes down to, do you want to spend money on this? Because it does mm -hmm. cost money to roll and implement those kinds of features. Um, it, that's not a feature, it should be a fundamental, <laughs> right? Yeah. But the way they define it and they, the way they classify it, you know... There's a lot of work to be done in that space, I think. And, mm. and I think a lot of web people or, or tech people get a bit of a bad name for not considering accessibility. But I think there are sort of, you know, driven, lots of other... Driven by the market. What it is. Yeah. It and is. it is difficult, especially, you know, responsive design, endless numbers of different devices of different mm. form it, factors. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. when you've got to design something where they're saying, I want it to work on the smartwatch and I want it to work on a tablet, I want it to work on a desktop. And then that's the problem because... 
there's a trend in, in web design now where everything, everyone talks about how every website looks the same, right? The, but there's a reason why lots of websites look the same is because it takes so long to create anything truly unique when you have to cater for so yeah. many different devices, for audience types, not to mention uh, low bandwidth, high bandwidth situations, or, you know, we build products that are used in, in developing countries, so you've got bandwidth yeah. to take into account as well. And we, uh, in my, my role was in a health tech startup in the, in the Southwest, spatial quotient, we, um, we're building tech for the, the NHS, and for, you know, we work a lot in ophthalmology, where your primary audience is, is generally elderly, it has sight problems, or they wouldn't be in an eye hospital, mm. and We've been looking at sort of how do you develop devices that can be used by those people and you've got so many yeah. constraints then. You're then talking about people who don't necessarily have much technology on them. Mostly they might have a mobile phone, mm. um, but they don't want to use it for anything except it being there for emergency. Yeah, I mean, public so. sector projects are incredibly interesting, <laughs> but you're right, the audience is a human being any, and everybody in between. Absolutely. Know, um, of all shapes, sizes. And, yes, it's challenging. And young and old. And we have got actually an audience question by Natalie. Um, she says, uh, hi, Natalie, by the way. Thank you for watching. She says, love the Southwest, but almost all the students I've spoken to feel the same about not being able to stay in the Southwest to work in tech. So the question is, how can we change that? And I think we've touched a little bit on it, but could I get one of you or both of you just to sort of summarize how we can get students to know that they can stay and they have all the opportunities they would have in maybe more traditional sort of sought after places for our industry? So, I mean, I, you know, I can start on that one because I'm actually... Um, we're recruiting someone at the moment. We're looking for a software developer. And um, it's a real challenge. Uh, you know, the job market is incredibly tough in the Southwest. It really is. And uh, so my answer to that person would be actually leverage what you've got to your advantage right now. That if you're in tech, and presumably, you know, you might be, or somewhere loosely around that, you know, if you are looking for a remote role, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm suffering from the other side of the coin because... I'm trying to hire a software developer, right? And I'm able to pay X amount of money. But, and, then, and then everyone says, well, you're looking for a remote software developer. That's going to be really easy. And it's like, well, actually, it's really not because now I'm competing against pe people that are offering salaries in London. Mm. So how can my salary expectation match a remote worker that could get a London role remote? They live in northern England where it you know, might be a bit cheaper, but you've got a 60K salary versus a Taunton salary. Mm. Um, you know, it's, um, it's hard. It's hard to compete. So as someone, as a candidate on the other side of the coin, you're in the Southwest, but don't think you can, you know, um, only get, you know, the average for your area. Because if you're good enough, then you'll be able to get a remote role in a London firm mm. that are willing to pay you 100K a year for whatever it is you do. Brilliant. So... Mm leverage the fact mm. that we're in the situation and I don't think it's going to change the remote working is here to stay and if you can get a remote role then you can you know get a job in San Francisco and just work work here but enjoy the perks of having a San Francisco salary and nice I, I think that you know comes back to what I think mentioned earlier you know to mm. in the past I, I did some traveling around the world looking at innovation ecosystems that's part of my background and one of the things that was rising at the time was was this idea of nomads with a k-n-o-w yeah. these people yeah. who've realized cottoned onto the fact that they do a digital role they don't need to physically be anywhere mm. lots of web developers and people who are working to mm. freelance and they're in places like um ubud in bali and in um yes, parts, please. Of, <laughs> parts of Thai. there's a particular city in thailand that the name escapes me right now but that people go because they surf and they meditate yeah, I mean, and they do it's yoga. A great lifestyle. And really then they be. go to a co working space and they code. Yeah, and that is coming, you know, I, I believe that strongly is a big sell for the Southwest. You know, yeah. Devon and Cornwall are beautiful places to live. I've, I've lived in San Francisco and London, and, and Devon is a real nice sort of pace of life, and you've got all that countryside around. So I think, I think we should be pushing. The you know the quality of life mm. that yep. is available down here, 
and say, look, you can still, as you say, work for the big company. Yeah. You can still go mm. travel to the, the exciting places. But you, you can, can go to you can go to Switzerland mm. and shoot yeah, some lasers. Mm. And then you'll still want to come back home. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I think you're completely right. So it's about access to the industry, which we know is there. So linking up students to local communities such as ours, we are always happy to pinpoint people as well to the right place to go. If there's something local that we know about, we will always promote them. Um, then the second one is actually letting them know that there's opportunities here. So um, as they go around asking for what what is there, what could their career path be if they don't want to do a stint in, in uh, in the super collider and CERN um, or <laughs> um, if they want to just stay local there is so many opportunities we've already heard of companies that we didn't know were existing in Taunton mm -hmm. um, so there is so much knowledge out there and actually just sifting through that and bringing it out I think is the main thing and making it available yeah I, I went to a career I, I, did, I took part in a careers fair recently for, for um, the southwest in schools to you know showcase a, a technological oh, role and I think that there was a really good idea trying to inject it directly into the school level to show people, to give them that knowledge about what's available. Yeah, absolutely. Way. I've been working, there's, there's a great scheme um, f for being enterprise advisors to schools, mm. a career service do. And so I've been working with a school in the region um, to to work with their careers mm -hmm. team and to look at how we bring sort of more people in. And, and one of the big things that works with people is seeing people like them in jobs and having mm. hearing about it. And unfortunately, you know, COVID has stopped there being on-site visits mm. and on-site mm. sort of mm. presentations. So there's a big, big call for that. So if anyone is interested in that sort of support, mm. then the Enterprise Advisor Scheme is, is quite an interesting one to get involved mm. with. So uh, basically just search for Tech Exeter on socials or for Digital Taunton, um, have a look around, connect with us, drop us a DM, or just connect with us via our websites, uh, which we'll be more than happy to point you to, to people and help you find your path. And for us, it's not uh, the fact that you're just an individual. We help individuals. That's why we are a community, because we're made up of individuals and we take a real interest and actually pride in, in the way we help people. And I'm seeing a very, very subtle clue here. <laughs> that we, we, need to, um, we need to move on. Move on. Which, is the, which is the please move on and stop mm. talking people. Um, uh, <laughs> we have done a Mario Kart um, game at the beginning before we actually came on air. And both of our guests have done three elapses. And I believe we are... Our, about to see the both of their best lapses and then is it am i correct chris in saying that we'll then reveal the winner yeah that's right i love how you say lapses yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all trying not to burst out I'm laughing just, i'm laughing on the inside <laughs> I, I'm, laps. You know, laps. Laps. Oh. <laughs> lapses i did some really good lapses yeah. um, i'm proud of my lapses okay I have lapses all the I, time. I have lapses. Yeah. I well, really do have lapses. Memory, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to see footage from three laps from each, from James and from Jane. We've timed them. They don't know what times they've got. Okay. Um, we'll play back the footage and then we'll I still the prefer lapses, not going to lie. Oh, yeah. Okay, so are you ready to see your lapses, guys? Yes. Yeah. James first. And maybe do the commentary, because Shane was doing some fantastic... I was getting excited. I was really getting into imagine, the kind of... Imagine Top Gear, imagine yeah. they're sat next to the Stig on the sofa. With a few um, more swear words than that. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Three, two, one. So what were you feeling like at this point? You know, I was just hoping the my, adrenaline buzzing, my right? misspent youth on <laughs> games such as Gran Turismo was going to pay off. So this is this is going around the uh, the studio room. Just just. You didn't use the mushroom. Side. No, I saved it for the straight. So uh, we need to get that. Oh, is that? So what does the mushroom uh, do? Speed you up. Speed you up. Yeah, yeah. I so. was using the mushrooms just to keep <laughs> me going. Fun. As soon as you. <laughs> well, I have. I nearly hit the. Uh, stop yeah, there's finish. some tricky, tricky um, gates to get through. Yeah. Here, aren't there? So it. Um, Oh, here's the mushroom. Oh, oh, mushroom. Prepping yeah, prep with the mushroom. There we go. Do you enjoy the strategy of a game? 
Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So do you get the do you get extra points for staying properly within the track or? No, it's the coins that you collect. But it? do they is there an increased score or anything? I don't think so. It's all about I don't know, it's time. Yeah. It's all about time. speed. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Well, can you just I cut across the middle? <laughs> oh, I did that. Uh, not intentionally, but you know, Oh, sure, sure. I did sure. a bit of that. Wait. <laughs> it was a new record. Was it because he was the first one up? And apparently you were wearing a snowsuit during lo- your last Oh, maybe because I wasn't wearing the right clothing that I didn't do very well. <laughs> maybe you were wearing the snowsuit that weighed you down. Yeah, maybe. All right, yeah. 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 All right Jenny, you ready? Aero- aerodynamic Let's now. see if your commentary oh. is as loud as it was when you were playing. Yeah. So at this point, there was Let's a lot of emotions. Let's get ready to turn down the <laughs> There was a lot of emotions at this point. Okay, three, two, um, one. I was just sort of channeling my inner Mario. Um, I started Saying, off alright. It's right. a me, a Mama Mario. <laughs> oh, and oh, just stopping. Uh, uh, just I, just, a... I went and picked up a mushroom. Just have it. And chill. then I had it on the bend because I was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> went straight through, grabbed a few coins, another mushroom. I thought I may as well just keep doing what I was doing. Um, oh. Things were looking okay at this point. It did then I think go a bit wrong. Um, <laughs> I took a mushroom. That got me. That got me level again. I like that you take the mushrooms just before the yeah. ends. <laughs> well, I like the adrenaline rush of having to steer it around the corner. Yeah, I really yeah. don't oh, want you to. Oh, oh, I got stuck. I got, I got unstuck. Here we stuck go. in the tape. And, and, as Chris is fine. And, no. and, 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 and then I went for a detour. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went into the wall. As you were Please going. never give me a lift anyway. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> and then and then I kept on going. I was hoping for a mushroom. Quickly take that down. Uh, oh, I did get a mushroom. Um, Ready to use I don't think right under the bench. Yeah, no, oh. then, then it started to kick in of what I had to do. Yeah. Oh, oh no. Oh, oh, oh it's that bit. Okay. Oh, Crush gosh. Okay, less. apparently you lo- lose, but yeah. do you really lose? Yeah. What I, is, what one more go, and I reckon I would have been really good. In three lapses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to make fetch happen now. It's fine. I just need to dust off my Fastest PlayStation. Fastest lap time recorded. And only <laughs> that. <laughs> James, 19.699. Oh, that six, was good. The seconds, not minutes. Okay. And <laughs> Shane, oh, 21.59. Oh, I'm angry. Yeah. We all knew this was going to happen. Though. Yeah. I mean, the signs were there. But I think you did we really We saw well. the practice. Am I bo- oh, don't be bottom. Oh, okay. So now, leaderboard overall with our guests from before oh, has, has changed the up a third. bit. Not in the so budget, Shane, so. you're third. James is second. And Alex. What was oh, so, yeah. so close, though. So close. Yeah. So close. You only need a few. Oh. Mm. Fractions of a second. Nano. Is that a nano? I am gonna, I'm gonna Thank go and you. buy one tomorrow, and I'm gonna be back here in a year's time. A gonna... year's time? Are you? you think we got, we're having you back? <laughs> <laughs> We when Philippa's here and you're joking. not, she'll oh, have me back. Oh, yeah. right. Philippa okay. have me back. Let's, uh, let's <laughs> I need a, a referee's whistle here. Why don't you host us up in yes. Yes. Yeah, and That's I'll, a have, really good you'll I'll build, have a Mario Kart You'll thing. build a ridiculously complicated yeah, Mario yeah. Yeah. I mean, get your own we just back. like to steal your ideas anyway. And you know anyway. what? I will take you on. Yes, okay. You can do some lapses. I will be and I will do some laps. And believe me, I will be training for this from tomorrow. Oh, God, we're going to cue the montage. Deal. <laughs> Sounds great. Brilliant. No, it was really good fun, though. Yeah, it's, and it's a great yeah. idea. It, I've not seen this done on a live stream before. And well, it was, we um, like to innovate. Yeah, it was very clever. Mm. Very good. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody who watched the live stream. As we said, um, connect with us on Twitter or Instagram. Find us on techexeter.uk. We have a Slack channel on there. We have a Slack channel as well. You can join. We're all of the Southwest tech and digital buddies are um and uh yeah thank you to you uh, to you two for uh being up for the mario kart fun as well as bringing some really good discussions to the yeah. to the fireside chat and we've lost our fire i would just I like know. to point that I out i feel I, I feel i've learned a lot about lasers and about taunted oh. and well, I'm, glad to, <laughs> I'm glad i could provide that service for you and um not quite as sexy as lasers but you thank <laughs> Thank you very much to Chris and Chris. Yeah, Thank and you to our wonderful sponsors. Which are Landmark, Set Squared Exeter, Grey Matter, and Stevensco. 
and uh, Software Soul, they're also yes. joining us as a, a sponsor. So. Thank you so much. So keep an eye out on our meetup across our channels for our next event. But our fire, uh, second fireside chat has been, I think, a success. Really good fun. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you and much. keep your eyes peeled for tickets for the Tech Extra Conference Absolutely. and lineup announcements so that you can access the conference. Mm. Oh, I, I see what you did there. really well. Ah, oh, that was painful. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.